Hi everyone, I'm Alex Samuel, the Executive Director of MIT Solve. We're here today as part of Solve at MIT, um, and I have two very special guests with me. Uh, Sergei Poloki is the Mikhail Horeshevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at the, and the Director of the Ukrainian Re Research Institute at Harvard University. Yuval Noah Harari is a historian, philosopher, and the best-selling author of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, 21st, 21 Lessons for the 21st uh, Century, and Sapiens, A Graphic History. Uh, his books have sold over 35 million copies uh, in 65 languages, um, and we're so delighted to have uh, you both here today. Um, and I'd love to get started and dive right in, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> hello, uh, hello to you both. Thank you, thank you for being here. Hello. Uh, and um, so let's start with a question that I think is on everyone's mind at the moment, um, and which is around uh, Ukraine. And here at uh, MIT Solve, our mission is to drive innovation to solve world challenges and find and fund social entrepreneurs all around the world. Um, but I think it's really important as we think about technology, innovation, social impact, to ground ourselves in history and its lessons. And that's why we've both invited you today as two uh, wonderful mm. historians. Um, and so thinking about Ukraine, uh, those of us who are old enough to remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, so the end of the Soviet Union, um, back in the day, we all thought this was the end of history um, and that the liberal capitalist and democratic models had won out um, and that we could solve all problems, that we could solve, uh, eliminate poverty, hunger, disease, that technology would be uh, there to really help us. Uh, but really, my first question is, was the last 20, 30, 40 years a period of anomaly? Um, is is this war mm. changing things? So if, if I can go, go first, I would say that it, it depends on us. It doesn't have to be an, an anomaly. I mean, if you look at, at the last 40 years, say, compared to most previous eras in, in recorded history, then yes, it was the most, by many measurements, it was the most peaceful era in human history. I know there are still wars in parts of the world even in the last 40 years. I live in the Middle East, I'm completely aware of it. But still, if you look, I mean, since 1945, not a single internationally recognized country was wiped off the map by external invasion and, and foreign conquest, which was the norm previously. You know, for the first time in history, more people die from suicide than from human violence. That, that's an, an, an amazing achievement. And I am, the best thing maybe is to look at, 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 at military defense budgets, at, def at, at military budgets. Uh, for most of history, all these emperors and khans and caliphs and kings, they spent most of their budget on their military. In recent decades, the average military budget of, of governments around the whole world is about 6.5%. And in Europe, less than 3%. Most of the money goes to healthcare, education, welfare, things like that. This is an anomaly in human history. But uh, it didn't result from some freak changes in the laws of nature. It resulted from humans making good decisions, building good institutions, and we can maintain this. We can continue to make good decisions and, and build good institutions. Or uh, if, if Putin wins in his endeavor, more and more of the world would look like uh, what's happening around in Ukraine and, and would look like Russia. I mean, nobody knows what the military budget of Russia is because it's a secret, but estimates are around 20%. This is how we, a relatively poor country like Russia built this military machine. If Putin is allowed to win, we will see defense budgets all over the world skyrocket and at the expense of things like education and healthcare. And it's a choice in which kind of, of world do we want to live? Uh, yes, I, 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 I agree with uh, what has been said. And it is an anomaly, but uh, it's up to us uh, to uh, turn it maybe into a new norm. 
And uh, mm. today we are at the point where really mm, uh, a lot of things will be decided for the next maybe 10 years, 20 years or even more. Exactly. A lot depends on the way how this war goes and more specifically whether the aggression will be stopped. Because uh, since the end of World War II, since 1945, there was also no, at least in Europe, there was no annexation of territory by one state, mm -hmm. territory of another. And it happened in 2014 with the, with the Crimea. Uh, uh, so we are back not just to 1989 or to 1991, when allegedly history ended, or at least the, the, the liberal era was supposed to arrive. But we are going back to the period of 1939, the, before the start of World War II. There were comparisons made between, of course, Anschluss and the annexation of the Crimea, and th there can be more comparisons of that kind provided. In terms of technology, to a degree, this, this new world is exactly, as you all said, is the result of the uh, wise decisions made by the politicians and, and the electorates, at least in democratic countries, making good choices as well. But it is also the result of the, of the fear of the nuclear annihilation. Because 1945, mm -hmm. that's, that's the time when the nuclear age started when the world saw the destructive power of nuclear weapons. And uh, some people uh, here in the U.S. who worked on that bomb actually wanted the bomb to be exploded because they wanted to scare the world. They wanted the world to know what kind of enormous power the governments would have from now on. And today we are in an age where there is a cavalier attitude toward nuclear weapons. There are much more uh, drivers on the nuclear highway than there was back in 1945, 1962, or 1989. And that is, that is a major challenge. How, again, to turn technology to serve us as opposed to allow that technology to destroy us. And maybe I'll, I'll just add to that, that um, many people who, who develop or well, the, the uh, cutting edge of developing technology today, they sometimes see technology as being above history, as being free from history, or able to just shape history any, any way it likes. And, it, and it's not the case. Technology is always not just developed, but used in a particular context, in a particular historical context. History doesn't end, it doesn't go away. And you know, when you develop a technology, a good exercise is to think about the politician you most fear in the world and to think what he or she will do with the technology I'm developing. Not only about the best case, what, not only what you are thinking of doing with your technology, also what they are going to do with the technology. And also, again, in, history is, is, is usually the, the never, moves in a, in a straight, simple line. You know, people expected this war to be this kind of cyber warfare with, I don't know, uh, 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 special forces jumping out of the screens and, and whatever. And in the end, we do have cyber warfare and we do have very new phenomena. Like people, you know, in the Spanish Civil War, you wanted to, to, to join the international brigades, you had to go to Spain. Now you can sit in San Francisco and join the international cyber brigades and help fight the war. But having said that, the, the war itself, it looks so much like the old war, like the old world. And you know, Molotov cocktails and not cyber we weapons have been far more predominant. And it's just not just in Ukraine. You know, in, in California, people have all, have all these dreams about uh, 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 a new uh, uh, virtual world and all these wonderful technologies. But one of the biggest political projects, at least in terms of the attention it got in Southern California and the whole of the Southern United States was building a stone wall. This is Neolithic technology. And so you have the Neolithic age and the digital age side by side. We don't leave it behind. It, it, it always goes together. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes, uh, 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 absolutely. Just, just uh, uh, one, one thing to add to that. Already in Ukraine, they talk about this war 
as a 19th century war that is very often fought with 21st century weapons. And the, 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 there is just this bridge between 19th and 20th century in, in one place in one time. Um, wonderful. And that's, and that's really interesting. And I, I want to rebound, I think, on one of your uh, comments, Yuval, about uh, and a good advice for our MIT uh, and solve audiences about as you design technology, thinking about the worst politician and thinking about how they might use that technology. Um, I think that's really good advice for, for our MIT and Solve audiences. Um, and I want to expand, if that's okay, from, um, from the conflict of Ukraine and this current geopolitical era to think about, to dive a, a little deeper in this, this piece about technology. And indeed, I think that the history of humanity is also the history of technology and technological development. And, you know, I'm an optimist and I like to think that overall, the technological progress leads to human progress and leads to good things. Um, but there's definitely technology also causes and has caused throughout history existential threats. Um, today, mm. I think, so, or at least personally, the ones that I see are around increasing inequality all around the world, uh, driven by automation and AI, nuclear disaster, which we already talked about and started referencing, and of course, uh, climate change. So I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into, um, into some of these topics if we have time. Um, mm -hmm. And as regards inequality, um, you know, there's sort of the centralization of power and resources has been throughout history yet again, um, a way that empires function. And today we see continued and increasing inequality and concentration of power in a few people uh, and a few corporations, and you know that's mm -hmm. that seems uh, similar to the golden, uh, the gilded age. And so, um, mm. and so, I'd love to think about: is there parallels between these two eras, and how do we mm. extrapolate the lessons around inequality from the past to think about how technology, instead of exacerbating inequality, in some cases, may in fact uh, reverse that or advance opportunities mm. for all. Yeah. So I if, can. I, I can. Uh, please, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can start. Uh, the, the parallel with the Gilded Age is is really a very very productive one, and again, this is this is a parallel about this growth and equality and concentration of resources and money in the hands of very few. But I would say that we are in a worse place now than we were during the Gilded Age, so the last decades of the 19th century, because during the last decades of the 19th century, you saw also the growth of the real wages by 60% uh, in, in the last decades of the 19th century. I don't think that we're actually doing as well now. So the situation is mm. is, 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 is worse than it was uh, during the Gilded Age. Uh, the question is uh, whether, whether development of technology is uh, responsible for that. To a degree, yes. Technology is very often responsible for good things, for bad things, for, for the best of the things and for the worst of the things. It's, it all depends on the society. It depends on what we do with that technology. And technology that we have today and that we have now, it seems to me provides uh, the opportunities for the uh, countries that otherwise would be maybe poor, would not be competing with the major powers or the imperial powers, uh, compete. And that's, that's especially mm. true, it seems to me, for IT. And look where the, the main hubs, or IT hubs now today. Some of them are really in the, in the so-called developed world, but others are in the world that is developing and sometimes lacks other resources. So it is not the gilded age of the 19th century where, when you really needed an iron ore and you needed coal and mm. things like that to participate in the world exchange. Now what you need uh, is uh, uh, brains, brains and education. So, but this is, this is uh, the, the technology gives us opportunity to be better than we are today and and not, not as bad as we are. Again, looking back at the uh, turn of the 20th century, we were in a better shape then. 
Uh, I think that I, I completely agree that on the one hand now, you can have a high-tech hub anywhere. You basically need knowledge. You need human capital, you need brains. You don't need steel and, and, and coal and so forth. The other side of the coin is that it also makes it much easier to concentrate all the power and wealth in just one place. For much of history, we always saw these inequalities, but you know, when the main economic asset was land, you just can't concentrate all the land in one place. It's, it's, it's a physical impossibility. Also in the industrial age, when factories and machines and coal and steel and all that, they became the main economic asset, still, you couldn't concentrate all the production in one place. It was a physical impossibility. So you couldn't move all the production just to Britain or just to Japan. Now, with the new digital economy, the main assets are on the one hand, the knowledge of, 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 of professionals, and on the other hand, it's data and it's computing power. And the thing is, you can concentrate all of them in one place. You can concentrate all the data of the world and all or most of the computing power of the world in just one place or a few places. And the more the economy depends on these resources, if we don't take counter actions, we might see the creation of the most unequal economy and therefore unequal system that, that, that ever existed. You know, it's not just where you develop things like artificial intelligence. It's also things even like the textile industry. Now in the textile industry, the most important thing is not the cotton fields and it's not the, the factories, it's the data. It's the data about what the consumers want, about the latest fashions. So we can see that even in a very traditional industry like textile, we might reach a point when all the key data is in the hands of just one or two companies, let's say Amazon and Alibaba, and that's it. So that's a very big danger we need to, to take into account, which never existed before. And it demands active, I mean, if we just leave it to itself, it tends to grow even more extreme. Data comes to data and wealth com comes to wealth. So to make sure that countries like Ukraine, like Egypt, like Sri Lanka, which is now really collapsing, would still be in the game, uh, we need some kind of global safety net and a better distribution of the dividends, of the profits of the, of, of the current technological revolution between the whole of humanity and not allow them to be concentrated in just a handful of countries. Um, and what's the, is the solution to that a, something like Piketty, a global transaction tax? Are there, is it about institutions and policy regulation? Um, I'd love to hear if, uh, if, the, if you have any thoughts on, on that, either of you. Uh, yeah, maybe Yuval, if if you if you want to mm -hmm. start on that. Yeah, I think one one key aspect is there will be a lot of I mean all these fears there won't be any jobs or things like that. There will be a lot of jobs in the future. The big problem will be and and people will be extremely valuable. The big problem will be in retraining people, and in educating people for the new jobs of the twenty first century. And the danger is that the rich countries, which are already leading the automation revolution and the AI revolution, they will have the resources to retrain the workforce. So you, they will become even richer. Whereas the poor countries, not only will they, they be the losers of the automation revolution, when it's cheaper to produce textiles in, the, in, in California than in Mexico, also they won't have the resources to retrain the workforce. So they will be left further and further behind. So we need some kind of, again, it can't be solved on a national level. All these ideas about universal basic income, they're usually just a national plan. We need to think internationally how to help countries, again, like Egypt, like Sri Lanka, like Ukraine, to transition and to prepare themselves for uh, um, this new economy. And again, going back a little also to, to, to the war in Ukraine, I mean, people there are fighting for the future. 
So I think one very important thing that Europe and the West should do right now is to promise them that they will be there to provide them an access to the future. Not help them not just win the war now, but win the peace later, that they will pull resources, not just to rebuild the country, rebuild the broken bridges and the bombed hospitals and schools, but actually to rebuild a, a prosperous society for, for, for the 21st century. And ideally, this kind of minimum commitment should be made to all other countries around the world, that they will not be left behind. Uh, because if, if, if this happens, obviously the shocks will reverberate also to the rich countries. If you think that you can live in this bubble of, of, of high-tech and automation and AI and be extremely wealthy, whereas other countries just completely collapse because their economic basis collapses and you will not be hurt by it, it's, it's not going to happen. It will, it will reach you also. Uh, yes, we, we have to think about that and approach these issues internationally. They're of international nature. You can't solve them on national level. Uh, in the 20th century, there was a quite powerful uh, movement for the creation of a global government. And there was, for a short period of time, a lot of excitement about the United Nations as maybe an institution that can provide more than just peace. Peace mm. was, was, of course, the, the, the main goal. It was the peace organization, the way how it was created. But there is a growing disappointment with the UN on all levels. And certainly, we are dealing with the institution that was created by the victors in the Second World War back in 1944-1945, where some countries are more equal than others, and this is institutionalized, this inequality in the world that is uh, right there. So there, 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 has to be, there has to be a different approach. There has to be a change. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, what we see now and what we see today is that the organizations that have more and more influence, they're being created outside of the United Nations. And uh, again, the, the legislature, the, the world le legislature just doesn't exist. But when you look at trade, when you look at, at uh, certain, certain uh, rules and, and sanctions are part of that, of that global kind of a order, uh, th there is much more. There is much more um, potential there. In, uh, uh, potential for the for the really spreading the, this wealth and and knowledge is part of that, of that story. Then it was with the old fashioned peace organizations, where of course, especially in the nuclear age, people don't and and for very good reasons, countries are concerned about fighting, fighting other countries with nuclear weapons. So I I, I think it's uh, the reform of uh, UN, and if it can't be reformed, really the institutions working around UN uh, that, mm. that, that, that have to take over. But we, 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 we are in, in a place where we can't just delay that action anymore. Uh, COVID is, is part of, of, of that story. It's, it's uh, governments, governments build walls around, uh, around themselves, but it's a global problem and can be solved only globally. And the war, the war is, is, is another example because what we see in Ukraine is unprovoked aggression by a bigger country, member, mem member of the Security Council of the UN. And uh, it is a global problem and it has to be uh, approached globally. Uh, aggression, uh, if aggression succeeds in Ukraine, aggression becomes a norm, an accepted, an accepted way mm. of, of solving internal or external problems. So again, it, it, it has to be an international response. Uh, absolutely. And what I, uh, what I think is also really interesting in, in this conversation is, is what makes, uh, according, I think, to one of your books, Yuval Sapiens, um, and many, uh, many other things, what has made our species so successful uh, in on this planet and, and across the earth is our capacity to cooperate and to create bigger and bigger mm. societies. 
um, and that that sort of like bees and ants were one of uh, the, the few cooperative species. Um, and this is tremendously important for everything you just discussed, uh, as well as one of the biggest issues of our time uh, that we need, that we face, which is around climate change. Um, and similar mm -hmm. to, to this problem of inequality and similar to uh, the situation in Ukraine, we really will not be able to address climate change without this cooperation um, globally and across countries. Um, and so there's there's a dichotomy there. We've come to dominate the world thanks to our capacity to cooperate, and yet we're completely failing to cooperate when it comes to some of these big issues, including climate change. How is there a way to fix that? Is is, is global cooperation too big compared to national cooperation? Uh, how do we make a terrestrial difference um, for this issue of climate change? Hmm. Well, I don't think that global cooperation is impossible. It's certainly far more difficult, just as national cooperation is far more difficult than cooperating on the level of a single village. You know, many people, uh, they think about nationalism in kind of tribal terms as if it, it's, it's, it's always was like this. People always lived in nations. And actually, nations are something very, very new in human evolution. Humans have been around for like more than two million years. Nations have been around for maybe 5,000 years. The oldest nations in the world can have a claim like ancient Egypt, maybe 5,000 years. That's almost nothing in terms of evolution. And what's, what's unique about nations and what's really good about nations is that nations make strangers care about each other. In a, in a hunter-gatherer tribe, you knew personally a large percentage of the other tribe's members. They were a family, your cousins, the friends of your cousins. So caring about them and cooperating, it came to people relatively easily. Nationalism is completely different. You know, in China, there is almost 1.5 billion people. Even Israel, which is a relatively small nation, it's now 9 million people. I don't know 99.9% .9 of the other Israelis. I still pay taxes so that they will get good education and, wealth and, and welfare and healthcare. And that, that's amazing. That's the good side of nationalism. Nationalism is not about hating foreigners. It's about caring about all these strangers, which you see as, as your compatriots. And I think this is also the key to reaching global cooperation. If we think about globalism and nationalism as opposites, like nationalism is about hating foreigners, so any cooperation with foreigners is, 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 is something that is, is treasonous or a betrayal of the nation, then there is no way forward. But this is ridiculous. Nationalism is not about hating foreigners. It's about, co it's about loving your compatriots and taking care of them. And there are many situations when the best way to take care of your compatriots is to cooperate with foreigners. Like we had now this pandemic. So I got a vaccine against COVID, which was developed by uh, uh, BioNTech, which is a German company founded by Turkish immigrants. And then the, the, the actual vaccine was produced by Pfizer, which is an American international corporation. It would have been uh, ludicrous to say, wait, 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 I'm an Israeli patriot. I don't take vaccines made by Turkish, German, American foreigners. No, why not? If it, if it helps, why not? So, um, and this is the spirit that don't think about global cooperation as betrayal of the nation, or we now need a global government. No, we'll still have nations. Most of the taxes we pay still go for the people in our nation. But in order to deal with global issues, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's climate change, we cooperate with other nations because obviously we can't solve this problem on strictly national level. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm in full agreement. Uh, just want, want to add that even with with COVID, you see you see nationalism there, and of course the, the national mm. uh, 
uh, nationally produced vaccines and and people either taking them for for uh, pseudo patriotic reasons or rejecting them for okay. for other reasons again sputnik comes to mind as as one of those vaccines mm. that were uh, actively promoted um uh, i'm 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 joining this conversation from vienna which used to be the capital of one of the major major european empires and now is the capital of austria which happens to be a part of the european union and uh, european union with all sorts of issues and problems and bureaucracy and 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 other things still till now this is the most successful uh, example of cooperation of uh, different countries as equals and uh, yeah. to be part of the european union you have to be a nation <laughs> you have you, it, this is this is a union this is a union of um, it, it sounds old fashioned but basically nation states Again, the, 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 there are some uh, varieties, there are some variations. And the, the, what, what you've all suggested in, in a sense of how it works, that your, your uh, loyalty to, to a particular uh, group of people that comes also with loyalty to a particular culture and, and, and particular state uh, uh, does not or is not supposed at least to be in conflict with the loyalty to a bigger to a bigger uh, uh, union european union in this particular case alternatives that we have historically so far they're empires and uh, mm. we know what is happening with the empires uh, again they, they they contributed in a major way to the development of technology to the development of culture there is no reason to doubt that you just uh, can go not just to Vienna, you can go to London, you can go to Rome and see what what the empire did and how it contributed. But you can also go to the to the other places where the resources were drawn by the empire and see what what, what was left there. So um, again, uh, the the co international cooperation it is about the cooperation between nations, international. And that that basic fact shouldn't be forgotten. That's that's the best what we have uh, in 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 today's world, and and historically, I'm afraid as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I like. Uh, I think one of the things that um, has been really successful with the the European Union, uh, which is uh, I'm French and British, so so uh, I, I was a member on both sides <laughs> up until recently. Um, is this idea of um, of multiculturalism and, in fact, positive identity politics that we're more together and uh, we're more in peace than this negative identity politics and the mm -hmm. um, and and sort of the the moral distance between things. And I think you're, the European Union is is well, there are criticisms still uh, a very good example of that. Um, and is that sort of one of the big, uh, to you both, do you see that as one of the big battle lines? A uh, series of people, and I would include, you know, the US among that, who see multiculturalism and positive identity politics as, uh, as progress and a good thing, and still, um, and still a world uh, stuck in the other and moral distance and negative identity politics. Hmm. If I may, I think that one of the bad things we saw in recent years in the West is this kind of culture war waged partly around the issues that you just mentioned. And one of my hopes is that the war in Ukraine would help the West end the internal culture war. Not just because of the need to unite against a, a much bigger danger, but because I think that in, in many ways, Ukraine shows the kind of hollowness of the assumptions underlying the culture war. I mean, the culture war is based again on this, this idea that uh, there is a contradiction between uh, liberalism and uh, nationalism, that uh, you need to choose, or that there is a contradiction between democracy and nationalism, and that you need to choose. And Ukraine just shows this is not the case. Uh, also, historically, 
nationalism and democracy and liberalism can go together. Very often they depend on each other. It's very difficult to create a functioning democracy without national loyalties. What underpins very often the democratic commitment is that you really care and appreciate the other people in your country. So uh, it's not a war, it's an election. And if you lose the election, you are willing to accept the, 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 other, the other side. Okay, they now have a chance to rule. I don't agree with them, but they are not my enemies. They are not there to destroy me. We agree on some, on some common key values. And this sense of belonging together is often, is often provided by nationalism. So nationalism is often the, the bedrock of, of democracy. And we see in Ukraine that people are fighting for, at the same time, both for the national independence and for the liberal democracy. It goes together. And you also see that their understanding of, of what patriotism and nationalism means is not hating, not just foreigners, also not hating minorities. You know, they voted overwhelmingly for Zelensky, who is openly Jewish, and as far as I know, also comes from a family which was predominantly Russian-speaking. So, so from the so-called Russian-speaking minority in Ukraine. Now in the West, this could be, you know, uh, now a festival of, of identity politics. But no, I mean, people don't see any contradiction. The fact that he's Jewish and he comes from a Russian-speaking family doesn't mean he's not a patriotic Ukrainian. He's also Ukrainian. So if, if we adopt this kind of spirit and it helps us end this, uh, our, uh, na the, this culture war in the West, it can reestablish uh, some kind of consensus. And I, I think that if the West ends the internal culture war, it has nobody in the world to fear. Uh, you know, the economy of Russia is less, is smaller than that of Italy. And the EU and the United States, together with the other democracies around the world, like Australia and Japan and India and so forth, they are the still by far the biggest economic and political and cultural power. If they tear themselves apart in the culture war, this gives the opening for, pe for people like Putin to do what they do. But if, if, if we stand together, there is no need to fear anybody. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I certainly agree with that. And on uh, on uh, Zelensky and Ukraine, uh, again, this war started under the banners of dividing Ukrainians along the ethnic and linguistic mm -hmm. lines. Uh, Putin's uh, Putin's mantra was that if you if you speak Russian, you are Russian, and you are. Um, identity is Russian, and your loyalty should be to, to the Russian state. That was that was the essence of the so-called Russian Spring that started in 2014, and it succeeded in some parts of Ukraine. But generally, Ukraine survived in 2014 and 2015 by uh, uniting across this linguistic and cultural and religious lines as as one as one nation. And what united it were exactly the, these values and ideas associated with the democracy, associated with freedom. It, it sounds banal, it sounds cliche, but uh, you look at what is happening in Ukraine, there is the, 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 this, this terms acquire, acquire a new meaning because people are prepared to risk their lives for them, people are prepared to die for them. And I, uh, I, I'm hopeful, I'm not optimistic, unfortunately, in terms of that the, what, what is happening in Ukraine will have this positive impact on the rest of the world that Yuval is talking about. But it's, 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 it should have, I, I hope it has. Uh, and on national and, and nationalism and liberalism and democracy, well, democracy works only in the group where there is a consensus on some basic values and some basic goals mm -hmm. where we want to get and nationalism and national solidarity is one of the probably most effective ways and the glue that provides that common understanding and if there is common understanding there is foundation for democracy if there is no foundation for democracy for, 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 for foundation in terms of the common understanding and common goals the democracy disintegrates into a 
warfare, cultural, mm -hmm. cultural, and otherwise. Um, and uh, again, the, we started this discussion by saying, okay, the U.S. Is, has this perspective and another country has different perspective. Uh, and unfortunately, I think it's very difficult to um, really use geography to uh, describe now where these cultural wars are happening or not and where the, the, mm. the, the things become nasty and nastier again. It, it used to be in the 20th century that the United States was really um, outside of a number of mm. the of the processes that started in, in Europe, both very good and very bad. But the rise of populism uh, that is certainly sweeping through the through Europe and Eurasia uh, is is as part of Russian of, of sorry of Russian politics and American politics and and as dangerous uh, in any country as it can be. So again, geography I think is is maybe again it, it it would be nice to talk about about the West and the rest, but it looks like we are we are vulnerable whether it's mm. West, rest, or 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 uh, anything in between. Uh, so it is it is a global challenge. Um, uh, thank you so much. I I completely agree. Um, I want to move on if uh if that's okay. A little bit looking forward to to the future and and hopefully mm -hmm. some hopes uh, and advice for our community of technologists and innovators who are devoted to social change. Um, and mm. one of these things is thinking, rebounding on some of what we discussed and um, this idea of uh, sort of even looking more broadly than, uh, than, than Europe and, and the US, um, but looking to, uh, to communities across the world who, who may not have access to, to many opportunities right now and how um, and indeed, uh, uh, peoples and, and uh, refugees across the world uh, and people who are still living uh, under two dollars a day and uh, and uh, and different uh, different underserved communities. How can uh, we think about uh, bridging this moral distance uh, and think about the futures uh, for the most vulnerable among us? Uh, and how do we use design technology um, to to help um, to help these people? Um, so one thing should be very clear is that the people who design the technology have enormous power to shape and reshape the world, and um, that they have choices you can design many different types of technologies, not just one. It's never deterministic. So for instance, you can, as an engineer, as an entrepreneur, create a technological tool for a government to survey, monitor citizens, or you can create the opposite tool for citizens to monitor the government. Um, for instance, we can have technological tool to help citizens monitor government corruption. Like you have these apps on, on, on your smartphone, which at the click of the button shows you uh, where government money goes to. Or you enter the name of politician and within a split second, you get the names of all the family members and friends that he or she appointed to this or that, uh, uh, in this or that ministry or to monitor corruption of, of corporations, like to easily see which corporations are evading paying their taxes. This is a choice that engineers and entrepreneurs can make. And so far, for example, most of the technology being developed in recent years is, is going from, from, from uh, 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 top to bottom, like developing more and more tools for the corporations and governments to monitor citizens and consumers. One choice is to develop the opposite type of tools. Um, and this can, this can lead to, to, to a big change. Similarly, the way that we see humans in other parts of the world. 
are we just harvesting their data? Because part of what we are seeing right now in the world, which we talked earlier when, about inequality, is a new type of empire, not like the Roman Empire or the British Empire, but a kind of data empire, or data colonialism, when data from the entire world is being harvested in the, in the data colonies and being concentrated in the imperial hub, uh, both in order to monitor what is happening, but also in order to fuel the development of new technologies. So to think about how to make it more balanced and instead of just taking the data out, maybe spreading like, you know, the research centers and the places which, which get the most benefits out of the new technologies in more and more countries and also within countries in, in more and more areas. This is a choice and there are many more choices like it. Uh Yes, I, uh, uh, I, I, I sh grew up and I was educated in the Soviet Union. So the, the only philosophy that was there readily available and we were forced to study it, it was Marxism. And the, the, one of the foundational things about this variety of Marxism that I studied was that there is a development of technology and automatically it gets transformed into the social change and social change eventually trans gets transformed into the political change. So stages in the development of the, of the society and they're driven by, by technological development. Um, I, I didn't like that idea at the time because just it was forced on us. But uh, I, I also, uh, as, as, as I started to to be exposed to different to different philosophies and 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 studied history i realized that this is there is nothing automatic about that i also lived through the fall of the soviet union and everyone believed that the um, end of history will come also with the help of technology because authoritarian regimes can't really survive if there are computers and, and then access to the internet and so on and so forth. And we see today that they actually not just survived, they're doing, they're doing very well. So the question is, what do we do with the technology that we develop or you develop? And the social responsibility of, 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 a, of a scientist, of a scholar, of an engineer, and you can use the car to do all sorts of things, both positive and, and, and negative. And the, the, the issue is that uh, in, in terms of social responsibility, it seems to me that the key is that the work of the, of the inventor, of the engineer, of scientist doesn't really end with the product being ready. To a degree, yeah. some very important part of that work only starts to make the world aware about that, to make sure that this particular tool, that this particular algorithm is used in the way how it was intended by the creators. And what I'm doing here is really, I'm adding more on your plate, not, not like you don't have enough on your plate moving progress, technological progress ahead, but that's where, where, where the social responsibility, uh, what it is about. And uh, it's, it's, it's also about, again, here I'm coming back to, to the issue of geography. That's where geography is extremely important because the wealth is, is uh, um, and inequality is something that you can put on the map. And um, again, uh, the, the, more, the more we, uh, the places uh, with the leading uh, world universities, uh, uh, MIT and, and Harvard and others, uh, can do is to uh, open open the doors of our institutions to people coming from from all over the world, through the campuses, through the workshops, and uh, uh, this is this is that something that I am, for example, involved at this particular moment. Given the number of refugees that uh, are coming from Ukraine, it's over four million looking both at people who are displaced, but also those internally, there are more than 10 million people displaced. And the question you as an academic, as, as a scholar, you ask yourself, how can you help? Uh, and that's, that's what I and my institute, institute are involved now. But again, uh, I think that this is, this is something that we got involved because of a particular crisis. 
but uh, uh, it should be it should be looked at something that uh, we should do not just at the time of the crisis, uh, but before that crisis came to the fore. So um, again, sorry sorry for the bad news, but uh, your work, guys, doesn't end with inventing something; it just starts. Uh, so maybe I can, I can build I think, on that. Oh, and, uh, maybe I can add something that, you know, very often when I, when I talk to inventors, to engineers, two of the most common kind of counter arguments are that the customer is always right and that the voter knows best. Which means like, yeah, I mean, you, know, you ask Facebook or, or Instagram and Twitter about their social impact and they say in the end, you know, the customer is always right. Nobody is forcing you to be in Facebook. If the customers didn't want us to do something, they would just leave us. And then they also say that, you know, the, it's a, in many countries of democracy still, if the voters thought that what we are doing is wrong, they would make a law against it. So we always abide by the law. If there is no law against, I don't know, an algorithm pushing fake news on people, it's probably fine. And the thing is, that, you know, throughout history, there was always these controversies whether the customer really has the power and the voter really has the power or are they manipulated. But what's happening now is, is it's, it's even deeper. The changes are so fast, so quick, that most people, not just voters, the politicians and the courts, they often don't understand what is happening. They don't understand the implications or the working of the new technology. Most of the people who understand the potential of the new technology, they don't start political parties, they don't run for parliament, they start a startup and want to make billions, which is okay, of course, but who is, I mean, who will build the parties to deal? I mean, I, I, I'm watching election campaigns around the world in, in the last 10 years, whether in the US or now in France, and you know, hardly anybody is talking about these things. Because the people who really understand what is happening are building the technology. You have a few exceptions like Audrey Tang, who is very kind of at the forefront of the technological development, and she went to become a minister in Taiwan and had a huge impact. But that's the exception. Most people who go to study computer science, they want to be the next Zuckerberg, not the next Audrey Tang. So it's very difficult to regulate, some, and it's not, you know, it's not because the public is stupid or people are not intelligent, no, it's really, I mean, in, in objectively, to understand what is blockchain, what is an NFT, how does this system work? And our entire political and financial system is being upended very quickly. Now you think about, I don't know, finance or taxation. More and more of the transactions in the world are not in dollars, they are in information. How do you tax information? And um, you, it's very difficult to build a political platform around a new taxation system for an information age when both the politicians and the, the public don't understand something like what is blockchain or how does cryptocurrencies work? And I would say to the, to the people watching us, so yeah, if, if a few of you would use your knowledge to go into politics instead of building a startup, that would be a very important step. And even the rest of you can devote some of the time to alerting the public and the politicians to what's really happening. You know, watching the, the, the famous uh, Congress hearing of Zuckerberg and the kind of questions that the Congress people are asking him, it, it was really, you know, shocking. And, um, and, and, and we need to fix it as quickly as possible. And we can fix it. I'll, I'll just say, I'll take just two more minutes to say that there are regulations, there are guidelines for, for, for how to fix the system, to give just, you know, three basic rules about how to manage our information system and surveillance systems and so forth. So three basic rules are that my data should be used to help me and not manipulate me. That's, that's a very old rule. I mean, doctors know it. So it should also apply to IT. Secondly, that we should never allow all the data to be concentrated in one place. This is the kind of high road to dictatorship. 
and to economic monopoly uh, uh, as, as well. And finally, that whenever you increase surveillance, top-down surveillance, we must simultaneously increase bottom-up surveillance. So if we have a new technology that makes it easier for governments and corporations to follow us and monitor us and collect data on us, that's fine. And, uh, uh, when we balance it with technology that makes it easier for customers and citizens to monitor the corporations and the governments at the same time. Super, thank you so much. And this is really good advice that as innovators of technol and technologists, we have a responsibility uh, around social impact and ethics, um, but that also we can, and I think we're doing this through Solve, we're as much as possible opening the doors so that more and more people all around the world can be innovators themselves and can connect to technology um, and also think about uh, ancestral technology and bring back some of the technologies that have been uh, proved to be sustainable throughout millennia. Um, mm. But uh, we're at time. So I wanted to thank you both um, for this great conversation. Uh, and if there's anything else in the last uh, 30 seconds uh, you wanted to add and to say goodbye to uh, our fellow audience members, um, then I want to give the, the last words to you both. So please, Sergei, I think so I, I spoke enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, I, I, I just uh, want, want to add to what you all said. And we ended up in the world that is sometimes called the post-truth world. And this is, this is both our responsibility, but it's also a challenge to us in, in a sense that what we produce, uh, our knowledge, and again, whether it's sciences or humanities or, or any, any field of knowledge, it's all, also our responsibility to go out there and, and uh, uh, spread the truth, educate people. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't do that, the post-truth world will actually destroy us, destroy the world as a whole. Uh, but uh, we will resist. So uh, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank, thank you so you. much to you both. Thank you. Thank you.